Hello and welcome to another episode of Ultra Low Brewing. In this video, we'll be running through the step-by-step -step process of our brew day on this fantastic and crisp tasting non-alcoholic lager. Using the high mash temperature and low gravity method, this beer came in at just 0.3% ABV and has a really great beery lager flavour with a solid malt backbone and a smooth balanced bitterness, making it a perfect beer for any occasion, any season and is a regular staple in my brew house rotation. The recipe is listed in the description below along with some key notes to observe to get as close to this beer as possible. Alternatively, you can follow the link to the Brewfather app to view the recipe and notes as well as save it for future use. I have also included a link to our website which has some great reading material, experiments and recipes to help you along your low and no alcohol brewing journey. So now we've seen how great this beer looks, let's take a look at the process and get started. To start with, we'll need to measure our grains. First up is light Munich malt. This will help add some rich, malty, bready flavour and aroma to our beer, along with some great colour. Next is Crystal Pale Malt. This will add a mild sweetness to help balance the bitterness of the hops and add some extra complexity to help increase the body and mouthfeel, along with adding to the colour to deepen the hue. Following that is Maris Otter, which has a rich, nutty flavour that helps add that malty backbone. Being that this is our main base malt, it's a good idea to keep it to a low percentage of the grain bill to reduce the fermentability of our wort. I'm also using some carapils in this mix. Being a dextrin malt, this will certainly help with increased mouthfeel while also increasing the foaming properties. It will also add a subtle sweetness. Lastly, I'm going to include some flaked barley. This will impart a rich, grainy malt flavour while also adding proteins to the beer to increase the body and mouthfeel. It will also help improve head retention. If you don't have the grains on hand, you can easily take the recipe into your local home brew store and have it weighed and milled in store ready to go. Now that we have our grain measured out, it's time to mill it. I run a very wide gap of 1.3mm on my mill, which reduces my mash efficiency due to the coarse crush of the grains, making it harder for the enzymes to convert the full amount of starches in the grains. If you're getting a brew store to mill the grain for you, you can request their wider setting they have available to help reduce your efficiency. Now that we have our grain milled, it's time to move on to the mashing. I start by adding my water to the mash pot. As I'm doing a full volume mash, I fill the pot with a full amount of water required to reach my final volume. I like to use RO filtered water as this removes all of the chlorine and minerals from the water, leaving me with a consistent and clean base water profile that I can easily adjust and create my own water profiles to match the styles I'm brewing. If you don't have an RO filter or access to a RO water station, you can use regular filtered water, spring water, or scheme water. If using scheme water, it is important to treat the water before brewing to remove the chlorine from the water to prevent off flavours. This can be done by leaving it in a bucket or a pot without the lid overnight to gas out, pre-boiling the water, or treat it with a Campton tablet. With my pot filled to my required amount, I place the lid on, set the controller to a strike temperature of 82 degrees Celsius, and turn the heat on. While that's heating up, I'll measure my water salts. To start with, I'll be adding some calcium sulfate, commonly known as gypsum. This will crisp up the taste and add some dryness to the beer while emphasizing the hot bitterness. Following that will be some calcium chloride. This will add a fullness and roundness to the beer, creating a denser, fuller mouthfeel. A little bit of magnesium sulfate, commonly known as Epsom salt, is added as a nutrient for the yeast. Lastly, I've included some sodium chloride, commonly known as table salt. This adds a little extra chloride, but it also adds a little savoury touch to emphasise the maltiness. Now that we've measured our salts, it's time to check on our water. 
With the water heating up close to my set temperature, now is a great time to add the brewing salts if you're making water adjustments to have them dissolve nicely before I get to my strike temperature. Remove the lid and sprinkle the salts on top of the water. Give the water a gentle stir to ensure they're mixed well. Next, add the mesh grain bag to the pot. This will ensure your grain is easy to remove after the mash. Now that the water has reached my set temperature of 82 degrees Celsius, it's time to add the milled grain. Carefully pour the grain into the pot. Then give the grain a gentle stir to break down any lumps that could have formed and ensure it's mixed properly. Now we place the lid back on, set the timer for 30 minutes, then leave it to mash away. After 15 minutes, I like to give the wort a gentle stir to make sure the wort is adequately mixed before taking a quick sample to check my mash pH in case I need to make any adjustments. I find it easy and simple to use a syringe to draw out my sample and quickly cool down to my calibrated temperature. Place the lid back on and finish the mash cycle. With the 30 minutes finished, it is time to lift the lid and remove the grain bag. Carefully lift the bag above the pot and drain the work from the grain. Alternatively, if you have a cake rack, you can place the rack on top of the pot and let the bag drain over the top of it. Give the bag a good squeeze to get the last of the liquid from the grain and then discard the bag. With the grains removed, I need to transfer the fresh wort to my boil kettle. If you're using an all-in-one brewing kettle such as a Brewzilla or Grainfather system, or doing this in a single vessel pot either over a gas burner or a stove top, you don't need to transfer the wort for the boil. Instead, just heat the pot or kettle until it reaches a rolling boil. With the wort transferred, it's time to move on to the boil. The first thing I need to do is ramp up the heat. Turn the system up to full power so I can reach a good rolling boil. This is also a great time to measure specific gravity of the wort to ensure I've reached my target pre-boil gravity. I like to use a refractor meter for this stage as I can take a few drops and cool the sample quickly and get a reading fast. So I can make any dilutions if necessary. With my sample taken, I place the lid on to speed up the heating process. Because I slightly overshot my pre-boil gravity, I need to add a small dilution to reach my target gravity. I give it a thorough stir to make sure it's mixed through. And then take another sample to ensure I've reached my target. While that's heating up, I'll measure my hops. For this recipe, I'm only using two hop additions. The first will be a 30 minute bittering addition with some super pride at the start of the boil. The second hop addition will be some sass, added at five minutes left of the boil for a flavor addition. This will impart a mild earthy herbal flavor with a hint of spice. With both of the hop additions measured out, it's time to check on our boil. My pot has reached a nice rolling boil, so it's time to add my first hop addition and set the timer for 30 minutes. With five minutes left of the boil, it's time to add the sass addition. With the 30 minutes done, it's time to cut the heat to the boil. If you're chilling the wort, this is when you would start circulating through your chiller. Because I'm using the no-chill method, this isn't necessary for me. 
I simply remove my insulation and let it start cooling. I then give the whir a gentle stir. Then with a syringe, I'll take a small sample so that I can cool it quickly and measure my post-boil pH so that I can determine how much acid I need to add to adjust prior to pitching. I'll also take another small sample to quickly cool so that I can measure my post-boil gravity, which will then become my original gravity. With a sanitised hose, I need to transfer my hot wort to a clean and sanitised food safe plastic container to cool naturally overnight. If you've used a chiller to cool your wort, you can directly transfer it to your fermenter ready for your pH adjustment and yeast pitch. By using the no-chill method, I save time and water that would usually be used to rapidly cool the wort. If you want to chill the wort, you would need to adjust your bittering hops to increase the bitterness slightly to match. I don't want to transfer all of the liquid because there is a lot of tube and hop matter at the bottom of the pot, so I want to leave that behind. With the wort safely transferred, remove the hose and put the cap back on tight. You can now place the cube in a bath of cool water to drop the temperature a little faster, or you can keep it in a cool place overnight to let the temperature drop naturally. With the sample I took post-boil, now cooled, I'll need to measure my wort pH to determine how much acid I'll need to add to ensure it will finish within a food safe level below 4.6 to prevent pathogenic spoilage. It is important to use a freshly calibrated digital meter to be sure you get an accurate reading. I'll be adding a small dose of lactic acid to lower my pH to 4.6 using a 1ml syringe to make accurate measurements. It is important to lower the pH prior to pitching the yeast. With regular beer, the yeast drops the pH quite a lot, but with ultra-low and non-alcoholic brewing, the micro-fermentation doesn't provide enough time for the yeast to lower the pH, so manual intervention is needed to prevent pathogenic spoilage, increase shelf life, and of course, for flavour perception. With the wort having cooled down overnight to my fermentation temperature of 19 degrees Celsius and my acid added to lower the pH, it's time to measure and pitch the yeast. For this beer, I'll be using the Mangrove Jacks M54 Californian Lager Yeast. I like using this yeast as I can run it side by side with an ale fermentation without the need to run two different fermentation schedules. It also provides a nice clean, beery profile. Remove the lid from the fermenter and gently sprinkle the yeast on top of the wort, making sure to sprinkle as evenly as possible on the surface. With the yeast added, place the lid back on. Alternatively, you can use cling wrap and an elastic band to create a sealed cover. Then place the fermenter in a temperature controlled fermentation chamber or a cool space in your house to maintain a steady fermentation temperature around 19 degrees Celsius for seven days. After seven days, take two hydrometer readings over two days to ensure fermentation has stopped. After having the beer fermenting for seven days, it's time to check for final gravity to ensure fermentation has finished. Drop the hydrometer into a degassed sample of the wort at the calibrated temperature and wait until it has reached a steady balance to determine the final gravity. It's important to measure the samples of the wort over two to three days to be sure no further activity has taken place. Once fermentation has finished, if you have the capacity to cold crash the beer, you can do so for another two to three days to drop any suspended yeast and or sediment before you transfer it to a keg or bottles. If not, then you are ready to package the beer. With a cleaned and sanitised keg, I cover the opening with aluminum foil. Then, purge the keg through the liquid outpost so that the CO2 travels through the dip tube and pushes oxygen upwards and out of the keg. Because I'm using gelatin to help make this beer as clear as possible, I'm going to add this to the keg first, 
so that it mixes with the beer as it's transferred. With a syringe, inject the gelatin mix into the keg. Then, attach a clean and sanitised hose to the fermenter, and sit the other end of the hose at the bottom of the keg with a small curl to prevent the beer splashing as it transfers and avoid oxygenation. You'll want to loosen the lid so that the beer can free flow out of the fermenter. If you're using a closed transfer system, attach your CO2 line instead. Now open the tap and let the beer flow. Once the beer has reached close to the tap level, I turn off the tap as I don't want to draw any air through the hose that can oxidise the beer. Next, remove the hose from the keg first so that the remaining beer and air don't enter the keg. Then, place the sanitised lid on and lock it into place. I'm now ready to hook it up to the gas and do a final purge and set it for carbonation and conditioning. With my keg in the fridge, I attach my gas line and start filling it with CO2. Once it has started to fill, I pull the PRV ring numerous times to vent the gas and try rid it of any oxygen that may be present in the headspace. With the keg purged, I leave it connected to the gas for two weeks to carbonate and condition until it's ready to drink. That's all there is to make this great tasting non-alcoholic lager. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel for future videos and more beers. Until next time brewers, cheers.